What I'd like to talk about is the clinical trial that we're proposing, or we are actually doing. So this, this is a cartoon that I'm showing you of what actually happens. So the individual is a HIV-infected individual, and on the top part, number one, is apheresis. So this is a, a, a process where blood is taken from the individual and the mononuclear cell, the white, the white blood cell fraction, is purified. So there's a small volume apheresis in which we purify one of the populations of cells that Lewis talked about, the CD4 T lymphocytes. And then those cells are isolated using uh, magnetic beads and they are uh, cultured. All of this work is in cell culture. Then the patient comes back for a second apheresis after they've, been, after they've taken a dose of GCSF, which causes the most immature cells, the stem cells, to come out of the bone marrow space into the peripheral blood, and they can then be harvested. And those cells are isolated again through a, a selection process, and those cells are put into culture. So we have two lots of cells in culture, the Cal1 vector that Lewis talked about as well with the two agents, the short hairpin RNA to CCR5, and the C46 fusion inhibitor is added. The cells are frozen, release testing is done to make sure the product is safe, and then both those cell types are in introduced into the individual to see if our theory is correct. That is, we can produce a population of cells within the individual that are protected from HIV and mimic the results seen in the, in the patient, Timothy Ray Brown, that Lewis talked about. So this process has begun. We are treating the um, cells of the first patient as we speak. We mentioned previously that we need to make space, and there is an agent called busulfan, which creates bone marrow space so that there is more room for the stem cells that have been transduced to expand and their progeny to expand to produce the population of cells that are protected from HIV. So where is the clinical trial up to? We received FDA clearance in October of last year. There are three cohorts, all of whom, all the individuals have decided to not take heart, highly active antiretroviral therapy for a period of time, for at least six weeks coming into the trial. There are three groups. One, who received the stem cells and T cells with no conditioning. The second cohort, who received stem cells and T cells with a low dose of conditioning. It's four milligrams per kilogram of busulfan. And then the third cohort, moderate conditioning with both cell types, eight milligrams per kilogram. The inclusion criteria, CD4 counts the lower limit. The, the CD4 count must be greater than or equal to 500 cells per microliter. And the viral load upper limit of 100,000, these are safety measures to make sure that the subjects who are entering the trial can see the trial through to its conclusion. So this is the design of the trial. It's the trial that is being conducted at the moment. This work is being done at UCSF, at the mission site, and staff are there processing cells. Um, uh, they have just finished processing the first patient cells. They will be frozen, and then re after release testing, they'll be infused back to the same individual. So that's all we wanted to say today. We wanted to describe the type of therapy that we are using we wanted to explain the rationale, that is to produce a population of cells that are protected from HIV, different to taking tablets for life, and that is the current therapeutic regime, and there are side effects of those tablets that can be severe. That This is a different paradigm. We're putting cells into the patient, into the individual, to produce a population of cells over time that mediate protection from HIV. And in conclusion, I'd just like to say what we are looking for. We're looking for safety and feasibility in this trial. The level of cell engraftment, that is how many cells actually contribute within the body and cell contribution over time. And then to acknowledge the various parts of this structure, the Calamune team members who are listed there on the left-hand side, the UCLA team members um, who we collaborate with. We have done mouse modeling experiments with those collaborators and early preclinical experiments. The key contributors, David Baltimore, Irvin Chen, Inder Verma, Don Song An, and principal investigators for the two sites, one at UCLA, that's Dr. Ronald Mitsuyasu, and the other at Quest Clinical Research, <clears throat> that's Dr. Jay Lalazari, 
And as I mentioned, the, the actual cell processing is done at the UCSF uh, Centre. We'd like to acknowledge the support of CERM, without whom this work would not have really been possible. And thank you for allowing us to speak and be part of this spotlight today. Thank you. What do we do now? Thank you, Dr. Simmons. Any, anybody have any questions for either gentleman? Yeah. Dr. Duliege? Yeah, first of all, congratulations, sincere congratulations to you, your team, Mr. Breton as well, for being, having done or doing this pioneer work, which is absolutely amazing and requires a lot of um, hope, future, and, uh, and dedication. Uh, two quick questions is, how large is the trial and when will you expect to have the first readout, you know, roughly? The second is, can you tell us, if possible, a little bit more about your interactions with FDA and how do you see the next steps after that? The interaction with the FDA? Yeah. Yeah, so, so the size of the uh, trial, it's 12 um, individuals, four in each cohort, the cohort one, two, and three that I talked about. Mm -hmm. the, as to results, we are treating the first cohort now, and that will take place over the next few months. Then the major readout is at 12 weeks to, to see that we're getting uh, reconstitution in, in terms of safety and gene marking. Okay. In terms of interaction with the FDA, that's been a very nice and pleasant process, actually. They've been very supportive. There's been iterations backwards and forwards in terms of the trial design, the safety measures, and we've been very happy with the agency. And the 30-day the window was also very busy, but we succeeded in answering the questions. Would you like to comment further? I'd like to just say something, actually, about the, the regulatory body. Um, you know, our space is maturing, the, the gene therapy space as a whole. And uh, we dealt with CBER. And it was a, a really unique opportunity um, to see how, because we had multiple things, obviously, that are quite unique about our study, how best to address them. And we have believed as a company early and often is the best way to coordinate. Um, and they were quite responsive. So uh, we think that that's because of all the heroic predecessors in the field that have really laid the groundwork for us to, to move forward in this capacity. Dean Pomeroy. Um, I too would like to add my congratulations. Uh, and, and as an HIV physician, um, I, I'd like everyone to just sort of stop for a moment and remember that they were here when heard about this, this study at this moment in history because I can think back to the first AZT trial and I don't think at the, that time we understood the significance of that trial and I want to make sure everyone understands the significance of what's being talked about here. I mean, I do remember three decades ago when this disease was inexorable and if I could have imagined then the fact that three decades later I would be sitting here listening to um, the hope that is engendered by this concept. Um, I don't think I could have imagined that because we were too busy um, holding people's hands as they died. And, and so now what this is, and we don't know if this one will work, but, but we do know that it brings hope and it uses the power of all of those patients who acted up all of those years and demanded research investment, and it uses the power of science to try and find a better solution than we've had to date. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Senator Torres. First of all, I want to thank uh, Jeff Sheehy for his very gracious remarks and for his leadership uh, for all these years. And thank you for both of you doctors for the wonderful work that you are undertaking, which I think is going to be a a testament to the confidence of the voters of California in creating this agency in the first place. It was in 1982 when I was chairman of the subcommittee, the Ways and Means Committee on Health and Welfare. And it was a very difficult time, very difficult time. We did have money, though, at the time. And so I was able to secure a $25 million grant uh, to people that were working on HIV, especially Dr. Marcus Kona uh, in San Francisco, who really did tremendous strides with uh, Carposi uh, scarcoma at that time. But it was very difficult to get the approval for that money. We were very lucky that we had some courageous legislators who at the time supported that effort. 
so for me as well, all these years later, it is so riveting and so inspiring to hear what you're doing. Congratulations. Thank you, and thank you, thank you for all your diligence over the years. Mr. Jules Garrett. <clears throat> so that now that you've been uh, appropriately thanked and uh, <laughs> applauded, I just have a question. So the approach that you're showing us is an autologous one. And the question is, is what is the opportunity to go from there to, uh, <clears throat> to a more general approach? Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to start, and then Dr. Simons, I'm sure, can add much more detail scientifically. And, and thank you, uh, Senator Torres. I, I, I have to say, though, I, I don't have a doctorate. Um, I'm more of a a translator. I consider myself uh, between business and science, so um, for that I'm not sure a doctorate is appropriate. Um, I believe that it's going to be important to begin the process of identifying efficacy before becoming more efficient. There are lots of different types of mechanisms to begin looking at ways to go, which where we're starting is obviously the, the the, the first world population. There are, there are uh, over 600 bone marrow transplant centers around the world that have facilities set up that, that could be the distribution path for this type of therapy. And, and that's an important factor, by the way. Um, anybody who's really considering this approach has to begin looking at how you're going to get this to a larger population. The other question is, is how else could you potentially move this beyond autologous cells? Well, th there are possibilities of doing that, um, uh, where it could even be an allogeneic uh, a, a, a therapy of sorts. And there are new technologies working in cord blood. There's a lot of people that are working with different types of mechanisms to push that process along, as is our internal group looking at ways to advance it. First step for us, though, is and, and we appreciate the applause. T to be honest, the truth is, is getting here has been a, a major, major milestone for the company, but, but we're still early. And um, we want to make sure that we, we move forward with cautious optimism. I, I would just add to that, I agree about the cord blood, that that's a, a possibility to make it less um, a, a, a patient specific. There's also means to automate the procedure to make it less of a cottage industry approach. So, and I agree with what Lewis said that first steps first, but we would aim to have it much more user friendly and um, automated. Any other comments? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.